So today we continue our series of webinars about our data management platform. Uh, before we start, I just want to say that uh, SPH Engineering is a multi-product company and as you might know, we have a lot of solutions uh, for drone pilots uh, and companies working with drones. Uh, so, you know, our ground control software, I believe, also we work with different sensors. Uh, and also, uh, we have a drone show product, and today we're going to speak about Atlas, our data management platform. So, okay, let's uh, move directly to the topic. So, if we speak about precision agriculture, then uh, we need to identify uh, several uh, you know several main activities which can be automated with uh, drones with software and one of the first things that i want to discuss is such thing like a crop scouting so if you look into wikipedia uh, then we will see that crop scouting is a process of precisely assessing pest pressure and crop performance to evaluate economic risk from past infestations and disease. So it's pretty complicated thing, but uh, in reality, this uh, activity is about regularly monitoring fields, plants, soil, and there are different ways how we can do it. And in this spreadsheet, I try to list, I think, the most common ways how to make crop scouting. Of course, the first one and traditional one is just inspect everything by food. Uh, the other method is to obtain a satellite imagery. And the third method is using drones. Each method has, uh, you know, pros and cons. So let's, let, 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 let's compare because that will give us a better understanding in which cases technology really can bring some benefits and in which cases traditional methods may work still good. So if we inspect by foot, then the speed of inspection, of course, is very low because one need to approach uh, fields, uh, a certain spots on the field by foot. It's not always possible to use car. And uh, of course, but, but at the same time, when you approach a certain location, you get most of possible information because you stay very close to possible areas with diseases or any other problems. So the accuracy and resolution of this kind of inspection is very high. But at the same time, the coverage is low. I, I, I would call it partial because you cannot cover the entire field. You always select only certain spots to inspect. And also it's very hard to make change tracking because you are limited to very small amount of spots that you can inspect. And this method is not scalable because, you know, to scale, you need more people to make this inspection. So uh, the cost is pretty high. It's, you know, it's in, <coughs> it's a new function of the amount of people you use for such kind of an inspection. The satellite imagery is super fast because satellites can acquire uh, data for very large areas, but at the same time, accuracy and resolution is very low. So the, if we speak about RGB imagery acquired by satellite, then I think one of the best possible resolutions that you can get now is something like around 50 centimeters per pixel. 
that, that's a very common thing. But but in most cases, for large areas, you will get like two, three, four, or even ten meters per pixel. So, but the coverage coverage is very good. You cover entire field. Change tracking is relatively easy because you can obtain imagery and compare for different periods of time. So and 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 the scalability also is very good. The cost that depends on the farm size because for for small farms, the satellite imagery can be a bit too expensive just because of the minimum size of the uh, satellite image that can be uh, obtained from the service provider. For uh, a large uh, companies managing, uh, managing um, uh, big territories, the, the, the price uh, like uh, of, of, of a square meter can be uh, in the medium range because uh, the area is big. In case of drones, I think we combine uh, best of two methods. So the speed is fast, at least for medium sized, small and medium sized fields. Uh, even with uh, commercially available drones, relatively cheap. So you can cover uh, hundreds of hectares during the day easily. At the same time, accuracy and resolution is very high because with drones, you can fly uh, on very low altitudes, like 10, 20 meters, and the ground sample distance will be around one centimeter per pixel. The coverage, entire field, obviously. Change tracking, again, easy because you accumulate data for different periods of time. You have a georeferencing, so it's pretty easy to compare one map to another and see the difference and also see how the field is progressing. The scalability is very good because uh, technically uh, it is possible to split the field into parts and fly it uh, with different drones, with several drones uh, simultaneously. Of course, uh, in most in in most co uh, countries, law uh, you know uh, enforce to uh, have just the one pilot and one drone. But technically, it is possible to have several drones to control several drones from one uh, ground station. And for example, in, in case of our UGCS system, you can you can do such a thing. So you can control it, a group of drones. And the cost of the data that you acquire, I would say medium. And uh, besides the uh, crop scouting, which we identified is like uh, checking the status of the plant and the soil, there is another task that can be solved easily with uh, aerial photography and drone technology, plant scouting. And for plan counting, in my opinion, we can apply absolutely the same logic and absolutely same comparison of characteristics. So the benefits are very similar because of the similarity in data acquisition and uh, data processing procedures. So uh, again, that's, that's not a secret. And actually, that's why we work in this area. Drones are an obvious choice for precise farming, yes. But that's only part of the solution because data acquisition is only half of this process. At the same time, I, I must know that, and, and actually I intentionally uh, added uh, DJI Mavic and Parrot NFE here on the slide because even with these affordable drones, uh, you can get a reliable data for many applications, e even without a multispectral camera. And I will explain why. So let's uh, so let's let, let's proceed. So why drones just a part of the solution? 
So if we if if we, if we, if we take just draw like Mavic and given we have five or ten ba spare batteries, so we can cover from one hundred to three hundred hectares per day with uh, a highly detailed resolution with GSD something around one centimeter or even better. And all these flights, they can easily be repeated with, uh, with a good ground control software like UGCS. So you can memorize many flights for different fields and you can repeat these flights every week. So, so the acquisition uh, right now is very easy. So you can you can acquire tons of imagery from your fields, and if we will do a simple math quiz and we will trans, uh, translate hectares into uh, image properties, then for example, for one hectare with one centimeter GSD with Phantom 4 Pro, we will get around you know 1,700 images which will be converted into a map of a size around three gigabytes and it will be approximately 10,000 megapixels. So I, I, we have a megapixel calculator on our website so you can easily, you know, you can do the same, you know, uh, exercise if, if you want to make a rough estimate for your survey, but uh, Still, three gigabytes, 10,000 megapixels support mosaic. Pretty large. And processing and inspecting this field manually, like pixel by pixel, can be complicated. So for this field, and if you have several fields and such inspection, such it may take up to several days. So, well. And what if a farmer must do crop scouting or plant counting every month or even every week? So we get to the situation when we have to work with dozens or even hundreds of gigabytes of photo mosaics. And uh, we have several challenges. Of course, we want to use some automation for that. And uh, our software Atlas, uh, it, it can reduce the amount of time required for processing. We can, we, 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 I think we can reduce it from days to hours. And that is what we see uh, on different examples from our clients. And we have some public cases on our website, so you can inspect them separately. But you know, I, I will show several during our webinar. So with Atlas, you can automate certain things. You can own, you can train your own detectors that will find objects on the map for you, will make these automatic annotations for you. And here's another question. It's a very standard question that we receive in our support. Why AI works so well? Because uh, many plants and diseases have a very clear visual signature, even on RGB imagery from affordable drones. So like on these pictures, as you can see, the uh, healthy plants are clearly separable from uh, background and from depressed ones. And that's uh, uh, and for many cases, not for all, of course, I don't want to say that multispectral imagery can be substituted with RGB. No, of course no. But for some cases, and there are many of such cases, even on RGB imagery, you can see and you can get a lot of useful information. Just what do you need? You need to have some tool that will help you to automate uh, this process. So Atlas automates several tasks. So First of all, as we already discussed, if we do inspections regularly, then we acquire tons of images and work mosaics. 
and we need some some place where we can store and share this data with our teammates, with clients, with subcontractors. Also, Atlas provides you with a tool, tools which can help you to train your own detectors for detecting areas with diseases or making a plant counting. Of course, on the regular plants, I'm not speaking about some random forest. It's a separate task. And the fourth uh, thing that Atlas solves is the ability to render some reports and expert detected uh, objects as a vector layers. Because of course, the uh, ultimate goal for all these activities is to get some insights from the field and generate some action plan. So, and as a result, you can get vector layers with area, identified areas, export this data, and send it to your field team, field management team. So Atlas can work with uh, different types of data. So you can upload, you can acquire imagery, for example, uh, NDVI map from satellite and upload this colorized map to Atlas and make a territory segmentation. Also, you can work with data from drone. So um, the, the overall process looks like the following. So we acquire data either from satellite or from the drone. Then you can, if you have just images like GPAC files, then you can upload them directly to Atlas, or you can use your favorite photogrammetry processing tool and generate auto mosaics and then upload these auto mosaics to Atlas. Then in Atlas, you can make a territory segmentation, train your detectors and analyze the uh, auto mosaics. Vector layers can be assessed through our web interface, which works on normal computers, on tablet PCs, so you can access them in the office or in the field, or you can export these results as a vector data to farm management software. Because of course, uh, big farms, they typically rely on some farm management software. But in most cases, farm management software, it's like a big ERP system. So it, it, it helps to manage assets, you know, different uh, materials, uh, and Atlas can provide additional source of information uh, for uh, crop scouting and uh, about the amount of plants growing on the farm. So just to summarize again, the Atlas data management we support data from drones and satellites. We can use either GPAC files or GOT files, images or the mosaics and elevation. And the storage in Atlas optimized for terabytes of data and optimized for many users in the organization. So you can easily organize teamwork. Atlas is a web-based application and it works in any modern browser either mobile or a desktop. So now let's let's see how the system looks like. So this is the screen of the system. And the most important thing to know, so it's pretty easy to upload auto mosaic here or to use our internal processing to stitch map out of images when you get a map. Then the most important thing to know is how to build your own detector. Uh, and uh, to do that, you need to uh, accomplish several very simple steps. First of all, you need to identify what you want to, to detect. In this case, we want to detect these red areas on the field. And uh, we do some manual annotation first. And that may take like, 5, 10, 20, or 30 minutes, depending on the uh, data set size, map size that you, that you work with. 
Then we need to specify the areas uh, of a background. Typically, uh, this can be an areas without any problems. So, uh, in, in case of agriculture, they may look like just a normal green vegetation. Uh, so that's that, that, and these two steps are very important because the proper annotation is a key to success. And I will explain in more details about different, about specific of this uh, process. But now, just remember, and you annotate some objects, and then you annotate some backgrounds, and then, as you can see, you just press train. And after training, you get results. So you get the segmentation results, you get uh, areas generated automatically for you, where red areas has uh, contours. And these contours are in vector format, so you can export data and then use this data in a third-party GIS uh, software or in farm management software. Or uh, in Atlas, you can do some counting and there is size measurement. So we do have some uh, basic reporting in the system as well. Uh, another question that we typically receive, why train all detector? And the answer is very simple because uh, there is no such a thing like a universal detector that will work uh, normally uh, on different types of crops, on different types of soil, and different uh, weather condition, in different seasons. So you always, um, because, because there is no, just, just to, to do such a thing, you has to be like a Google or Microsoft and to acquire a lot of data, just, just to provide something universal that work, will work out of the box. And no one has such amount of data. That is why we propose another approach. We propose a simplified process that can help you to train your own detector on your relatively small amount of data. And you can do it in one or two hours, you can get first results. Because same objects look very different, differently from season to season in the different parts of the world. So, and that's actually, that's the answer for this question. Why you need to train your own detector? Uh, because we see that like trees look very differently, uh, crops look very differently. So, uh, even one, one crop, it, it looks like uh, in the very beginning when it just appeared out of the soil, it looks one way, then in one month, it looks differently in two months, again, uh, it changes. So that, 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 that's why you need to train your detector and then you just need to adjust it from time to time to keep it in a good shape and, and perform well. So, and Atlas, yes, as I already mentioned, Atlas delivers this flexibility of custom AI models for your specific tasks. And you don't have to be an AI professional or high team of data scientists. So you can use the software for that. So now let's quickly walk through uh, the list of some cases. So, and the first case, actually that's exactly the same that they just demonstrated to you. So just a high level territory segmentation. When you get an image from a satellite, following the procedure that I just demonstrated to you, you can train your own detector that will generate these vector layers on top of the ORT mosaics. And these vector layers, they can be used for area size measurement and uh, object counting and can be exported and used in the third party solutions. Actually, absolutely the same can be applied to a data acquired from drones. For example, if you have a high resolution field, and in this case, the ground sampling distance of the data is two centimeters. And our goal here 
is to identify areas with yellow color. Yellow color, uh, the field has, certain parts of the field has a yellow color, have a yellow color just because these parts of the field uh, affected by a weed. And we want to identify this area because manually it is very hard to uh, draw these contours because you actually have two options. You either will draw very approximate contours, but that can work not very well, for example, for variable rate applications like uh, chemical spraying, because either you, you will just spam too much chemicals. Uh, and that, that's why we, you need very accurate shapes. And uh, of course, manually, it's very hard to achieve. With, with AI, you can do this. So it can generate for you. And also, you can see the sizes of this area. And you can, for example, see the percentage of the uh, infected areas, uh, percentage from the entire uh, field size. And that's what you can easily get in the atlas. And by the way, this case is uh, publicly available on our website, so you can inspect it. You can see the map. Uh, you can play with the user interface and uh, see the results. Zoom in, zoom out, actually, you know, inspect this data. Then, uh, tree counting. Uh, in case of tree counting, uh, we also can use Atlas, but uh, uh, the procedure will have two steps. Uh, first of all, we will, uh, we will make an area segmentation, and then we will apply a special post-processing tool in our software that will substitute the uh, polygons generated on the area segmentation during the area segmentation process into dots denoting the, uh, for example, tree centers. So that's, and, and finally you will get the result uh, like on this picture. And this result can be used uh, for counting. And the reason why we have this two-step procedure is, is because if we, for example, use satellite imagery, sometimes trees stay too close to each other. So just the normal area segmentation, uh, territory segmentation may generate a single polygon for two or three trees staying too close. But to resolve this issue, we have a special tool that can split this large polygon into three individual objects. And we have a separate uh, tra training material about this too. My, my goal right now is just to, uh, to mention this possibility because we receive a lot of questions. Also, also uh, the uh, atlas can be used also for cattle counting. Of course, it's a little bit more sophisticated because cattle can move. And uh, if you acquire, uh, if data acquisition is distributed in time, then you know, the same animal can appear on different pictures. So that will affect the quantities. So uh, there are different techniques for making cattle counting if the uh, number of any animals is relatively small and for example uh, and the field uh, also is not that large then of course the best approach is to climb high with a drone and get just a single picture of an entire field in this case uh, you will get an accurate numbers if you'll try to stitch a map then you may lose some animals or you know, you, you may find some ghosts, <laughs> the animal that appears twice or even you know, three times uh, uh, on the same territory. But again, cattle counting is also a possible application for the system. So how AI works? Uh, 
small fraction of technical information. Uh, in short, the idea is very simple. You show what you want to detect to AI, and AI tries to find similar objects based on provided examples. And that brings us to this four-step procedure. So the first, and the, this is a very important step, we need to annotate manually several data samples. And the quality of annotation affects the overall performance of your model. Then you just press the train button in the software and the software makes some magic for you behind the scene. When the training is over, you receive an email and then you can inspect first test results. So after training, software generates some first detections for you. So you can validate training results and check if the results look good to you and bring some value, then you can just stop at that point and you know, export the generated vector layers. Or if you are not satisfied with training results, then you can change your annotation. In most cases, that's uh, the main a way how to fix the detection results. So you change annotation and train one more time. We allow to train a single model for several uh, iterations because so you can, you know, gradually improve your model. Um, and um, at some point when you see that everything is okay, um, you, you, you can just stop. And here's a very important hint, and that's what I want to share with you, because we have two modes of uh, running the detector. So uh, the default mode is when the detector is applied to the entire map. But uh, if you are not confident about the result, then uh, that can bring you just uh, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of uh, trash on the map, which uh, uh, you uh, you will want to improve. Uh, also, that will take time. So our recommendation is use uh, working areas. So working area is just a simple polygon that you can add to the map. And this polygon has a name. So when you run training, you can select, you can uh, tell to the system that you want to run detector only on selected areas and then pick those working areas that uh, you want to work uh, in after training. Uh, so, and for example, if you have a map which, which is around, I don't know, 200 megapixels, then maybe for first training, it is sufficient just to annotate area um, of one megapixel. That will, uh, that will save a lot of processing time for you and also it will deliver fast results. And when you're satisfied with results, you can apply this detector to the entire map. So that, that, that's a quick hint. Also, we uh, speak about this technique in our, uh, in our getting started manual. So actually, if you're not, if you feel that uh, um, um, you experience any difficulties with uh, training and you feel that you burn to uh, too, too much megapixels then feel free to you know approach our support team we will be happy to share this knowledge with you and to advise how to uh, save your time and you know uh, processing capacity and make your process efficient so uh, then, next very important topic, why GSD matters. So, and GSD is ground sampling distance. So that's uh, literally, this is a amount of centimeters of Earth surface in one pixel on your image. And the bigger GSD you have, the, uh, uh, the uh, bigger objects you can, like, uh, the, the, the lower detailization of the map. 
So, for example, if you have a GSD of 50 centimeters per pixel, which is, well, as I already mentioned, which is uh, maybe the best possible GSD for satellite imagery right now, then this is how the uh, palm trees will look like. And this is an image to the left. Uh, but uh, this GSD, uh, like one centimeter per pixel, you can even see leaves on trees. And this is an image to the right. So, uh, if you, so when you when you plan your survey, and when you plan your uh, uh, model training, you need to understand uh, what is the physical size of the object that you want to detect. And if the object is too small, and you understand that given you have like two centi uh, 10 centimeters per pixel, the uh, object will occupy only a few pixels on the image, then there's a chance that you, you will not be able to get some consistent results with AI. So you need to carefully plan your survey so the objects on the image uh, on, on image uh, could occupy at least 10 or 20 pixels. Uh, I think that's bare minimum for AI detection. So keep keep it in mind. So uh, you need to plan carefully your surveys. So uh, next important topic: bad and good annotation. Annotation is crucial for getting good results, and uh, uh, but at the same time, the rule is very simple. So uh, you need to annotate two uh, things. You need to annotate object of interest. And in this case, object of interest is uh, marked with circles. And you need to annotate background. And background is annotated with a rectangle with dashed uh, line style. So what is important and why the left image is bad? Why left annotation is bad? Actually, because as you can see, there are many trees within the rectangle which are not annotated. This means that neural network will treat these pixels as a background, so they are not background. And uh, on the image to the right, we fix this issue. So we annotate all images within the background area. And knowing this rule, knowing this rule, you can get good uh, results, even uh, just with a single iteration of model training for some cases. So th 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 that's important to remember. Again, just to summarize and to reiterate uh, key annotation rules. Annotate objects of interest. Because you need to specify to the neural network what are you looking for and which objects neural network have to look for. Try to accurately separate pixels comprising object of interest from background. That's a very important. So try to keep an accurate contours of object of interest. Try not to say too uh, much of background into the object of interest. That may affect the training. Specify background areas because without background areas, neural network will just not, do not know. Will just not know what, how to separate properly object of interest from background. And all object of interest, objects of interest uh, presented in each background area should be annotated. That's what I just demonstrated in the previous slide. Also, uh, we recommend taking certain GSD as a standard for specific tasks. Uh, because uh, GSD difference uh, may affect uh, the neural network performance. 
I know that for many professional surveyors, that's not a problem at all because they typically have a very clear standards for GSD for, for a certain tasks. So they, for example, for construction side, they acquire, I don't know, like five centimeters per pixel because that's, that's enough. And for agricultural tasks, they acquire like two centimeters per pixel or depending on the task. So, but please, GSD can be any. So Atlas can work literally with any GSD, of course, depending on the physical object dimensions, but it is highly recommended to keep a constant GSD for a certain detector and for a certain type of task. Now, so we are almost done with the, with, with the presentation, but I want to uh, give you a bit more information about the infrastructure, overall infrastructure and possible options how you can use Atlas. So Atlas is available as a cloud service. So you can approach atlas.ugcs.com and you can register to our, our cloud service. Generate account and start working with your data. Also, but also Atlas uh, is available as on-premises. Uh, installation. So we understand that many companies, uh, they don't want to share their data to any public clouds. So they prefer to keep everything in their own uh, data center or in their private Amazon AWS or make Microsoft Azure. So we offer an option to deploy uh, entire Atlas software to a private cloud or to a private data center. So no one from our team will have access to your data in this case. And the system can work without internet. Only for license activation, you need internet connection. And that's an on-premises option. So in case of cloud-based plan, I just made a screenshot from our website and this is what you can find on our website right now. So we have free plans, the starter, uh, Explorer Plus and Business Plus. And an important note is that for starter plan, uh, existing UGCS users can get access to their UGCS code. So, so you can play with the system if you're, if, if you're an active UGCS user. Uh, for Atlas and premises, uh, we have um, a pretty moderate requirements for the hard, physical hardware. Of course, that can be projected also to requirements for cloud-based infrastructure, but uh, to start with Atlas and premises, you need just two servers. And the servers uh, can be just the high performance gaming PCs with Linux operating systems. So if you have any questions, if you want to have this uh, private deployment of Atlas, you can drop us a message. We will send you a specification according to your needs. Of course, that depends on the amount of data you're going to accumulate and process during the year, but the starting configuration is very moderate. Again, like, like, like a high level gaming PC. So uh, you can explore uh, more information about Atlas at atlas.ugcs.com. You can find features and also use cases and also some training information. So feel free to approach this website. Also, there is a con contact form there. So if you have any questions, you can always uh, drop a message to us, we'll be happy to answer and uh, discuss your specific application of AI. So just feel free to let us know uh, if you want to discuss anything. So 
basically that's it and i will be glad to answer questions um, yes maybe while you start to reading them i will just comment the first one so we have stefan uh, com uh, commenting in chat that good uh, annotation dip are dip depend on the engineer's experience and of course that's true so uh, we had a, a, a another webinar uh, on uh, describing uh, in detail how to better annotate uh, data to get a better result so visit our youtube and we will uh, we have the recording there uh, yes and in chat we have one you have desktop app for atlas uh, cloud or not A desktop uh, or the cloud version, but there is no app. No, you just uh, put in your we, account we, we, and Atlas. Atlas is a web-based application, so you don't need to have a desktop app, separate desktop application. So you can work with Atlas from any browser. Uh, if you need uh, offline installation, then you can consider Atlas on premises. But again. Uh, Atlas is not just a normal desktop application like that you can deploy on any laptop. It, 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 it's, so it's a web-based application, so you can deploy it in your office, but um, if you think about something that you can take to the field, then most probably Atlas is not, not the right solution for that because a bit too complicated in, to, in terms of infrastructure. Hmm. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Uh, I actually I opened Q and A section and I can just walk through the list of questions. Yes, yes, great. Yep. So the question from Fai: uh, Does Atlas provide an API? Uh, yes. Uh, so we we have some basic REST API and uh, we are working on this API. Uh, so. You can, uh, if you have some specific project in mind, then you can drop us a message and uh, we can discuss. The availability of a certain uh, services as an API calls. Um, with regards to detectors, what code base would the detectors be developed in? Uh, so for, for those who use Atlas through our user interface, all this stuff is hidden under the hood, so you don't need to use any programming language to train your own detector with Atlas. So you, you, you have to use just user interface for making annotations. And all the training, we already developed neural network architecture, which are optimal for a certain task. So what you need to do is just to feed uh, annotations and then just press train. But Atlas is a, has a modular architecture. So if you, uh, for example, want to use on-premises installation, or you want to uh, add your own neural network architecture to Atlas, technically this is possible through the API. So you can build your own neural network and use Atlas as a data management system. Use Atlas for annotation, for storing results, but but you can implement your own detector on any programming language that you like. Again, this is not a feature that is available right now for a cloud-based installation. So if you have, like, if you are not, if you feel that our existing neural network architectures uh, uh, are not sufficient for you, then drop us a message. Uh, we can discuss. Uh, how we can you know, uh, help you with this integration. Hope that answers the question. Uh, next question. Is the farm management software part of Atlas solutions or a third party software? We do not offer the farm management part because this is a pretty complicated topic. And uh, so Atlas covers uh, territory segmentation tasks. So you can easily make crop scouting with Atlas, plant counting with Atlas, and then export results as a vector layers to farm management solution. So 
the same way that you will interact with just a normal GIS system. But there are a lot of farm management services on the market, and we're definitely not planning to implement another one because there is a clear integration path between Atlas and the farm management software. Next question, can you use Atlas with them DEM rasters for stockpile detection. So now we can do some, uh, oh, we can use ortho mosaics for detection. We support them uh, data for volume measurements. So uh, also uh, in April, we will introduce uh, additional uh, services for uh, different volumetric tasks. So uh, please try Atlas. If you feel that something is missing, missing, just let us know. We, we are very open for such, such conversations. Uh, next question. So does Atlas process RGB thermal and multispectral data to generate the Orta mosaics and DVI-MX and other agricultural index maps. So now we work with uh, RGB images. We also can stitch maps from images containing new infrared channel uh, and stitch work mosaics. Um, is it possible to train the algorithm for different problems? Yeah. Uh, for example, beads, malnutrition pests uh, simultaneously in parallel and have them show up as a separate problem areas. Yes, you can uh, do uh, separate detectors uh, for each uh, type of problem and apply them to the same map. So you will have separate level layers for each uh, problem. Um, does the GPEG images for Atlas require metadata like your special information? So if you are not, uh, if you so, uh, if you do not need this georeferencing information, then you can upload GPEGs without this metadata and just process these images taken, for example, from just an ordinary camera, not not from the drone. So, 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 so the simple answer is no. For GPEG images, we do not require geospatial uh, georeferencing metadata. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, So Alexei is referring to train your detectors. Could you clarify what he's referring to as a detector? Is he talking about the camera on the drone or is a detector a process within the Apple software that we must use to zoom in on a weed, for example, to train the AI to identify the weed? Yes, the detector is a part of the Apple software. So you upload uh, ortho mosaics and images to Atlas and then or you, Atlas uh, helps you to identify certain areas on the field. So this, this is part of Atlas software. When building the detector, can we import shape file for the objects? Right now you can import the annotation as a GeoJSON file. So shape file will be supported shortly in one of next release, but now you can simply convert shape. Uh, almost any GIS system supports export to give JSON, so you can export to give JSON and then import to Atlas, and these objects will uh, can be used as a manual annotation. Uh, then. Uh, what kind of geographic reference systems are supported? Do I have to use only ortho mosaics? Uh, uh, WGS84, or can I use also UTM system? 
you can actually you can use uh, almost any coordinative system. Uh, uh, so it's not required to uh, convert uh, Orto mosaics into w, uh, WGS84 before uploading to Atlas. So we will like uh, process. Uh, so this, if that is a standardized uh, coordinated reference system, then uh, most probably we can deal with it. Uh, do you have any mapping software or hardware to control the drones during the data collection phase? If so, what is the minimum type of drone used? Uh, yes, we do have. And uh, actually, uh, our flagship product is the ground control uh, software which works with different models of drones and the software helps to plan uh, flights for DJI drones, for non-DJI drones. You can check, you can visit UGCS.com and check the list of supported drones. Uh, almost all commercially available uh, drones on the market like DJI, Parrot uh, are supported. So uh, yes, we do have such kind of software and uh, the software allows you to plan proper missions and in such way that the data will be acquired uh, with the proper GSD and the proper overlap. So yeah, please, please check uh, UGCS.com. Also, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, drop us a message and we can give you more information. Also, you can check, check our YouTube channel. There are many videos on that channel where you can see how the software works. Uh, uh, if you are on the startup plan, can you pay for additional AI processing above 500 megapixels or do you need to upgrade this, the tier? Right now, uh, we have fixed tiers, but shortly we will introduce the ability to purchase additional megapixels without changing the plan. Uh, so, yeah. But right now, right now, actually, if you feel that you uh, have some one time job that just uh, hits the limit of your current plan, then just Post a message to our support team, and uh, I think we will sort it out with, even without changing your current plan. So, but I think in 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 a month or so we will just add the ability to purchase packages of megapixels. Uh, uh, will you need to train on certain crop? Uh, uh, deficiency on every flight or once per year per crop. Same with a specific weed. Um, very, very good question. And that's exactly what I tried to explain during my presentation is that uh, crop uh, can change a lot during the year. So I think uh, if we speak about uh, monitoring during the entire uh, life cycle of a certain crop from, you know, from, <laughs> from the nursery level to uh, the final, final stage, then the crop can have a very different color, very different shape. So I think you might, if you, you might need to uh, train several, uh, spend, like spend one year to train several detectors for each season, but next year you will be able to reuse this detector if for, for the same territory for the same crop. So I'm not sure if one detector will be sufficient for just 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 for entire life cycle. So but 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 several. Again, that depends on your um, uh, you can share your typical workflow. Uh, with our support team and our consultants can help you to better understand how to properly plan your spendings on Atlas. That, that's what we regularly do, so just, just feel free. We, we will not charge you for that question. Just, just send us it. Uh, 
Is it possible to analyze hyperspectral images? Uh, no, so far. Uh, we are trying to understand uh, which types of analysis um, we can implement in Atlas. Uh, so if you are open to have a conversation with us, we uh, will be glad to call you and discuss the hyperspectral analysis because this topic is too broad. You know, now we are providing tools for building detectors easily, but in case of hyperspectral data, um, mm, we, we, we have a lot more variations and options. So uh, we are discussing it internally and with our clients, what can be included in our standard package. Uh, Is it possible to share a train detector with uh, uh, a different independent user working on Atlas? Uh, yes, uh, now we do have such a mechanism. Uh, so you can like train your detector and then share it with your neighbor uh, who has similar uh, similar fields, for example. Uh, um, the question again, uh, if we have subscribed Explorer Plus and at one moment we need more than 5,000 megapixels per month, the subscription is switched to Business Plus or we can pay the amount of extra analyzed pixels. Again, uh, we do not have uh, right now, a mechanism to uh, obtain more megapixels without changing a plan. But because we are uh, strongly planning to do that, so now if you just hit such a problem, uh, let us know that you need extra megapixels. Uh, let our support know and we will sort it out. But shortly, such an ability will appear in the system. Uh, uh, does the detector take into account row or other shapes rather than color patterns of pixels during the disc discrimination? Uh, of course, we do not rely just on color. Uh, that's this is not how uh, deep neural network networks work. We actually uh, we rely on many factors. And again, uh, so we use uh, simply speaking, we take into account colors, uh, shapes, uh, relative positions, uh, different texture specifics. So a lot of factors. So uh, and also we uh, uh, during training, we synthesize some additional data which makes the model more reliable. So that, that that's a complicated process and we do not rely just on color. Yeah. Um, you sh you've shown the tree detection. What kind of resolution do you recommend to detect any individual tree at what AGL? A great question. So uh, first of all, you need to understand the tree size. Uh, on a regular plant, in most cases, you will have trees of more or less the same size. So, for example, uh, uh, I, I demonstrated to you. Uh, I demonstrated to you um, tree counting example with satellite imager image. So that satellite image had uh, fifty centimeters per pixel. And uh, the trees on the plant, they had a radius of around uh, two meters. So the diameter, something around four meters. So uh, you can just, we can just divide one by another. So four meters divided by uh, 50 centimeters, we have like eight pixels uh, width. 
And because trees are more or less circular, so we have like uh, eight pixels uh, width, uh, width of eight pixel and height also eight pixel. Uh, it can be a bit smaller. I would say that for tree detection, it can be like from five to eight pixels per such an object. Uh, but this is how you can you can like calculate the required GSD. And in in in, in UGCS flight planning software, we have an, a tool. If you're already familiar, you know that we have a photogrammetry tool which helps planning. Uh, uh, photogrammetry missions, and one of the input parameters for this photogrammetry mission is GSD. So you can roughly, uh, roughly calculate the required GSD following the same procedure that I just demonstrated, uh, and then you can uh, input this GSD into our photogrammetry planner, and this photogrammetry planner will. Uh, in UGCS will calculate the required uh, altitude for you. So the procedure is almost completely automated. So almost no manual work. Um, um, the question, do you plan to develop a desktop app for Atlas in the near future? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for uh, Again, with the same functionality, no, Atlas uh, can be assessed for the web browser. Uh, uh, we, we are not going to implement all the same functionality as a desktop application. We partially have this functionality in our photogrammetry processor, uh, which helps to stitch maps out of images in UGCS mapper, but there is no object detection and that software so if you need object detection then you need to access either our cloud installation or you can get uh, uh, an on-premises uh, on-premises license and deploy everything in your uh, infrastructure uh, does atlas create the orta mosaics uh, yes uh, can we merge different detectors? Uh, right now, no, but you can have multiple detectors for the same map. So you will run them separately uh, and you will generate uh, layers, uh, different, uh, multiple layers for the same map. Whew. Very good questions, thank you very much. So yes, really a lot of questions and, and some already answered and written by our support. So great, uh, we'll have to continue our communication with you all afterwards also. So yes, um, it seems that we have done a great job today. Alex, I thank you for the presentation. So yes, uh, atlas.ugcs.com uh, is the place to reach uh, out for more information. You will have the shortcut to our YouTube with the videos. And there is also a shortcut to the learn section where uh, some lessons are presented and manuals have to use Atlas. But of course, reach out to us, to Alexei Yanklevich or Alexei Karek and to our support team and we will provide you all the required information. So great, thanks. Uh, we appreciate the time which you shared with us today. Uh, it's great we managed to, to fit in the, this one hour. So thank you very much. And we will keep you posted with the recording of this webinar and with invitations for next upcoming webinars on this topic and other our products. So thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks. Bye-bye.